I called my parents from jail. Yeah. And um, I said, I'm finally ready. I, I need some help. And they had a plan in place for years. Uh, but they knew that if they forced their plan on me, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have any success. Yeah. And that seems to be pretty typical. You know, mm -hmm. if people haven't really hit their bottom, mm -hmm. then they're not typically ready mm -hmm. to get out of that bottom. They're so, not. Yeah. They're not. And and the bot everybody bottom's different, but essentially your bottom's when you stop digging too. You know, <laughs> and so yeah. I was just ready to. I, I was done, and I really needed some help, and so they. Uh, sent me to a, treat, a a 90 day inpatient. So back to you think about it's not just one and done. Then I even went to sober living after that, mm -hmm. which was uh, I did that for seven months. So all in all, I spent almost a year in treatment. Now it was at varying levels. One was an inpatient, and the other one was an outpatient. But you were still kind of in the recovery community of sober living. So I spent almost a year in yeah. recovery, and and I still and I still practice it, uh, the, the 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 principles mm -hmm. of it uh, to this day. Many of the script principles in recovery I found as I studied the Bible more, they're rooted in scripture, which, fat, which fascinates me. Yeah. Uh, even the 12th step of AA says, faith without works is dead. And it's this idea of, okay, now that you're fixed, go help others. And it's, I mean, that's yeah. what we find in the gospel anyway. Um, so I remember being about four days clean and in treatment. Um, and I, I was in the fetal position. Um, in uh, in the shower, crying because I it was three a.m. I couldn't sleep. You know, there's the physical detox, but then there's the mental detox. Physically, I'd stop. You know, sweating and the diarrhea and the chill, all that was gone. But man, I just couldn't sleep because you go six years of just passing out every night due to alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, you just you just don't go to sleep easily. So it's three a.m. I'm crying. I said, you know, I was like, God, I don't even know if you're there. Um, yeah, but. Uh, Said I want one of two options to happen. I, I, I got two options for you, as if I could give God an ultimatum, right? But I said, sure. I either one, want to like die. To yeah. right, we like to be right. <laughs> so one, I want to die, mm -hmm. or two, I want a bottle of whiskey to magically appear in front of me. And I said that, and uh, I was like, God's like, no, there's a third option. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember grabbing a Bible that had, for some reason, always followed me. Uh, uh, throughout my moving and, and everything that happened. I had this Bible that I had in high school and I took it with me to treatment. I don't know why, I was a proclaimed atheist. I was like, I couldn't reconcile the moral problem of evil with God. And I was like, that, there can't be a good God out there. And so that's what I, and basically that's just my way of rationalizing my selfish behavior. Yeah, because if there's I, no God, then do whatever no you want. Exactly. Yeah. And so it was, it was easy. It was a cop out because then, yeah. yeah, I can do whatever I want. And it's as if I really knew that I was being held accountable, and it was my way of suppressing the truth and just saying that way I can just do whatever I want. And so I got the Bible and says, God, you know, I, I honestly don't know if you're there, but if you are, I mean, I'm going to give you 100%, not 99.9, not, .9. I'm going to give you 100%, um, and I declare that this, this book in front of me is truth, and I'm going to do everything that it says. Uh, and so then I just started reading, I just started reading, and, and I must have read the New Testament three or four times during those 90 days. I just could not because it's just as if yeah. Scripture just opened up to me for sure. the first time. And you're there. Mm -hmm. You've got the time on your hands. Oh, yeah. you got a lot of time. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and it, but even but what helps supported that is I went to, we, we did step studies. I had one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions. We had group sessions to process uh, we had process groups where we, we would talk and there was a lot of helpful things that happened in treatment. We had family sessions. I mean, uh, a lot of good things um, yeah, that sure. work if you give it 100%. And I think people that uh, say that AA doesn't work, I, I, would, I would push back on that um, and say, well, did you really do it? Because right. in my experience, especially being on the front end, because after that I started sponsoring guys, and I could tell a difference because the guys you can tell when they're really doing it. Because like the fifth step is hard, the fourth and fifth step. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, you got to list off all your resentments, and it's not just something that you know you, you're angry at. It's something that you, res you, yeah. you rethink and rehash. Anybody and, that has an addiction, that mm -hmm. addiction started somewhere. Oh yeah, and the absolutely. addiction wasn't. It didn't begin with whatever the substance is. You know, mm -hmm. if your addiction is food, it didn't start with food. It didn't. And so, yeah, and typically, you know, it's it's wounds, it's hurts, mm -hmm. it's resentment, it's anger. Whatever situations you've been in, those are the things that build together to create mm -hmm. all those things that you've got to list off. Right. So, yeah. 
Yeah, re recovery taught me I didn't have an alcohol problem. Mm -hmm. I had an Alex problem. And I used alcohol to cope with the Alex problem. And that's yeah. what, and so, you know, through the fourth and fifth step, I figured out that any, any resentment or any anger or anything, most of the time boiled down to one of two things. I was either validation seeking mm -hmm. or placing unrealistic expectations on other people. Yeah, sure. which, which I still do to this day. I'll, I'm the guy that'll hold the door open for you and they get mad at you when you don't say thank you. Sure. So it's, <laughs> yeah. did I really do it to be of service? Or did I do it because I wanted you to recognize that I was doing something for you? Right. Matthew 6, 1, take heed that you don't do your charitable deeds before men. To be seen by them, you will have no glory from your Father in heaven. And that, for, I mean, I just... I memorized that for one of the classes here, and that just, oh my goodness, because that, that's me. It's like, hey, everybody, look at me. Look right. at what I'm doing. I'm not really being of service. And then when you don't validate me, when you don't say thank you for opening the door, I get angry, and in order to cope with that angry ang anger, mm -hmm. I go drink. Or if you don't perform to the expectations that I selfishly set on you, when you don't live up to that, whatever it is, I'm mm -hmm. expecting you to do something, and you don't yeah. do it, when you don't meet my selfish expectations, I get angry and I go drink. And so that was this pattern that I saw develop. Yeah. And in that, you know, that same vein of thinking, you know, people tend to be very selfish. Mm -hmm. And people tend to act out of their own best interest. Mm -hmm. And when people don't respond to the way they act, they then think, well, that justifies me then not doing what I need to do in this relationship, Absolutely. you know. And, uh, the, you know, of course, the problem there is that Scripture tells you it doesn't really matter uh, you know what the other person's done to you. Mm -hmm. You're to act this way. Right. This is how you act. This is how you live the Christian life, and you don't do it for them. Right. Uh, you know there are people that have entire theories on how most human actions are a result of retaliation, and um, mm. I don't know if I fully agree with them. But at the same time, there are a lot of things that people do as a result of retaliating against something someone else has done. Mm -hmm. Oh, you said this to me? Well, I'm going to go do this over here. Okay, well, you can do that, but you're still responsible for that choice. Mm -hmm. And the Christian message is, that's not the choice you have to make. You don't have to act out of vengeance or retaliation. Mm -hmm. You don't have to self-medicate because you are upset with how you were treated here or there. Uh, what you do instead is you humbly go before Christ and go, look, this world is hard, this life is hard, help. So, um, when you are in the process of recovering, you mentioned that you guys had some family sessions mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Why is it important for the people you're closest to to be part of the recovery process? Addiction is not a spectator sport. Yeah. I mean, it's not that I'm not playing a one-on-one a, a -on -one game with just me and whiskey. It's, it's not that. I mean, it's a full, it's, it involves the whole family. My addiction affected my family. Gratefully yeah. so. I, I mean, so much so to the point where I didn't even make a minute, make amends with one of my sisters till I think it was nine months or a year later because it took mm -hmm. that long for her to recognize that I was serious about yeah. my recovery. And I don't, I don't blame her. I mean, for for six years I was lying. I, every Christmas I showed up drunk and high. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mom didn't hear from me for months, and so she's wondering whether or not I'm alive. Yeah. Uh, for months on end, and so yeah, the, the fa involving the family in the in the recovery process is important because there's a lot of wounds mm -hmm. that 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 need to be healed. And if I just go off uh, and try to do recovery on my own and not involve the people that I love that I've hurt, mm -hmm. then am I really addressing? I mean, I might be addressing part of the issue, but not uh, that. That's not going to promote holistic recovery. Right. Well, and if you're not doing holistic recovery, mm -hmm. you're just putting a band-aid on certain yeah. things, mm -hmm. and then those wounds are going to reopen. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, you, you spend a lot of time reading the New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, you talk to God mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit during that, those 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, how has your walk with the Lord changed, or um, how has it grown in your time since then? I've discovered purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, the gospel invi it invites everybody into something bigger than themselves where they can participate. Uh, I think the gospel has a cosmic level and an individual level as well. And so it invited, it, I realized that, hey, I can be part of something bigger. 
and I find purpose in serving others. Mm -hmm. uh, which again, that's rooted in the AA in the AA tradition, where you know, fix your junk and then help other people fix their junk, and, yeah. and that's essentially the AA program boiled down. Yeah. Steps one through eleven, fix your junk, and then step twelve is just go I'll do it. And so, yeah, it's sort of like the Christian <laughs> discipleship, right? Exactly. You become a disciple. Then exactly. You become exactly. So, you know, you become a recovered mm -hmm. addict, and then you help other addicts recover, mm -hmm. because who better to help? than people that actually know what they've experienced. I mm -hmm. mean, for people that had never been addicted to something, or people who have never dealt with certain kinds of addictions, mm -hmm. for them to think, oh, I can go fix you. You can't yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's just not possible. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, then when I got out of, when I got out of treatment, I, w I was blessed, there was, and speaking of discipleship, there I started getting involved in church, and there was a guy, uh, I maybe had, probably about a year sober, there's a guy up there, uh, Brian. Uh, who kind of saw me just sitting in the back, kind of feeling, because I knew I needed to be in church. I didn't know why. Mm -hmm. I tell you the truth, I couldn't, I mean, it's funny, we're going over ecclesiology and systematic, and now I, I can put it all together. But it's interesting how as a new believer, I just knew I was supposed to be there. I couldn't explain why, I just knew it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I need to get involved in the church. And so this guy kind of, I guess he picked up on that, that I just didn't know why I was there. I just knew that I needed to be there. Mm -hmm. And he kind of introduced himself, singled me out, and then he ended up mentoring me for about yeah. two years. We met weekly, and he poured into me. And I started asking some, uh, um, some deep questions, uh, and, which kind of eventually led to me coming to Criswell because I was asking uh, questions that he said, you normally do, like believers that have been, in the faith for six months or a year, they're not asking these types of questions. Mm -hmm. You know, like for Christmas, I wanted, I, I asked for a book on, um, uh, I want to know what Paul's social world was like. Yeah. I want to know about that. And so my sister got me, uh, uh, the so Paul's The Social World, I think something by, uh, by Meek, some, mm -hmm. and like, I, I, I didn't yeah. know what I was reading. I had no clue that this was some renowned scholar that's an expert in the field of Second Temple Judaism. Like, I had no clue, but here I am, like following Jesus for a year and a half, and I'm eating this up and highlighting. I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and so through all that process, I, I, I noticed that there's something that's driving me to just study Scripture more. And so through all that, it has grown, um, grown my faith, led me to, you know, Criswell to seek a degree in, in, in biblical studies. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, very good. So I think that, um, you know, when it comes down to um, the way that different, you know, different believers, you know, their, their life has radically changed. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes, uh, you know, I, I did an interview years ago with John Schlitt, the lead singer of Petra. Oh, okay. Christian Rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar um, with him. And uh, he, you know, before he joined Petra, he was the lead singer of Head East. Okay. Uh, Head East um, had, had the old classic rock song, Never Been Any Reason. Right? Okay. Uh, and... Uh, he was their lead singer and was fired uh, because of his cocaine addiction. He mm. was fired because he couldn't stay sober for the mm. concert. Mm. And so he had left the band and he was drinking a lot, doing a lot of drugs. His wife was a Christian. Uh, I don't know exactly when she became a Christian, mm -hmm. but she had been going to church. And um, he had gotten to the point where he was getting ready to commit suicide mm. and said to her, uh, uh, he had come home drunk and she said, I need you to go to church with me tomorrow. And of course, the next morning he wakes up and she says, get ready, we're going. And he's like, where are we going? She said, you're going to church. You told me you would last night. <laughs> and, uh, he's like, I had, no memory. I had no memory of telling her that. But I knew that I needed to go with her because I told her I would. And uh, he said, I was planning on killing myself that day. But... I said, if I go with her to church, she'll at least know I tried. Mm -hmm. And so he got to church, and while he was there, was just like, it's, it's God, I need God. Mm -hmm. And it was that day he stopped cold turkey and never did cocaine or um, never drank ever again. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty impressive, mm -hmm. but that's not most people's story. It's not. And um, one of my favorite characters in the Bible is King David. And King David is described as a man after God's own heart. But this man after God's own heart lusted after a woman he saw on a roof, had her brought to his palace, conceived a child with her, then conspired to have her husband murdered on the front lines in a war, and then took her into his home. And um, just like other kings of Israel, he had multiple wives. Uh, so this guy who's a man after God's own heart 
also has a whole slew of moral failures. Mm -hmm. um, this guy who's considered by most Christians to be one of the greatest you know, individuals in the Bible, I mean, not counting Christ, of course, right. but um, you know, people look at David and they go, this guy understood God, mm -hmm. and he did. But he was also a very sinful man, mm -hmm. and he was a fallen person, just like all the rest of us. And so we look at people like David in the Bible, or we look at Peter and Paul, you know, um, Peter um, tells Christians that you need to live for Christ. You need to be willing to die and suffer for Christ. But he also denies Christ three times on the night of Christ's crucifixion. You know, all of us who are Christians are normal people mm -hmm. with normal, everyday, day-to-day -day struggles. And different people have different struggles. So people with addiction problems, just because they become Christians doesn't mean those necessarily go away. At the same time, those who do have those problems should be able to find solace and help and encouragement in the church, in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're saying, hey, I knew I needed to be there. And you needed to be there for mentorship. Mm -hmm. You also needed to be there for fellowship. Because everybody in the church is saved by the same blood of Christ. And everybody is equal in Christ. There's no, um, you know, well, this person's more spiritual because they've done this. Okay, well, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how much education you have. If you are in Christ, you are equally in Christ with everyone else who is in Christ. But we all need disciples, we all, or disi disciplers. We all need mentors. And uh, you know, I've been a Christian now for 31 years. And I still have mentors. Mm -hmm. And I look at them uh, and I think, wow, you guys are so spiritual and... I have so much to learn from you.